Hi, my name's Ryan McKay, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about delusions. Uh, just a bit of background about myself. I'm a professor of psychology here at Royal Holloway, and delusions is a subject quite close to my own heart because it's the topic that I did my PhD on many years ago now, and it's a topic that I'm still actively involved in researching. So what are delusions? Uh, well, they're, they're false or unjustified beliefs, often with bizarre content about bizarre themes that appear as symptoms um, of a range of different clinical conditions. So psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia, for instance, and also neurological diseases like stroke, uh, acquired traumatic brain injury, dementia, and epilepsy, for instance. Um, so today I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about um, how we as psychologists go about trying to make sense of, of delusions. Um, how, how can we understand delusions? First, however, um, let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by delusions. So one common delusional theme is, is paranoia or persecution. So many people who suffer from delusions believe that there are shady organisations uh, that are tracking their movements, um, vast conspiracies that might be out to get them, or perhaps uh, think that their neighbours are pumping poison gas into their, into their home, for instance. That's a very common delusional theme. But delusions can be altogether more exotic as well. So there are, there are cases of people who believe that they've got two heads, people who believe that, they've, uh, that their loved ones have been replaced by physically identical imposters, people who believe that they've died or that they've ceased to exist in some fashion, and people who believe that the person they see when they look in the mirror is not them, but a stranger who might be following them about. So I hope you'll agree with me that um, it's pretty striking what some of these people, uh, the beliefs that some of these people express. So today we're going to try and um, give you a little bit of insight into um, some thinking about how these, these kinds of beliefs might be adopted and maintained, often in the face of um, you know, flagrantly disconfirmatory evidence. All right, so how can we explain delusions? Well, there have been a, um, a range of different types of, um, of explanation for delusions over the years. One, um, one famous type of explanation is, is the sort of Freudian kind of psychodynamic explanation. So Freudian style theories explain delusions in terms of um, the, the kinds of psychological benefits that someone who is deluded might gain from the delusion. Just to give you a couple of classic examples. Um, so one delusion that I mentioned earlier is known as Capgra delusion. Um, and this is the imposter delusion. People with Capgra delusion believe that someone close to them, perhaps a, a spouse or a close relative, um, has been replaced by, by an, an imposter, a doppelganger. Um, it's called Capgras delusion because it's named after a French psychiatrist, Joseph Capgras, who first described the clinical features of this condition. So um, Freudian uh, oriented theorists have sometimes explained Capgras delusion in the following way. They, they've, they've argued that people with Capgras delusion are trying to resolve ambivalent feelings that they have towards someone in their life. So, um, the, for instance, if you um, have ambivalent feelings of love and hatred towards your spouse, that might make you feel distressed and uncomfortable. And perhaps one way of resolving that, that ambiguity, that distress, is to convince yourself that your loved one is not actually your loved one, but an imposter who looks a like, lot like them. So that's one kind of classic sort of idea about Capgras delusion. Those sort of Freudian oriented ideas um, have sort of fallen from favour in, in, in recent years, however. And most theorists these days prioritise instead neurocognitive accounts of, of delusion formation. So with neurocognitive accounts, the idea is that there's some kind of disruption or damage to the brain, and it's that brain damage or disruption that um, produces the, the delusional belief. So you can think of, of a delusion as being sort of the faulty output of a, of a damaged or disordered system in this way. So um, I, I want to focus on, on a particular neurocognitive account of delusions today. And um, I'm just going to start out by telling you about the, the ideas of a, of a famous psychologist called Brendan, Brendan Ma. Um, Ma argued that delusions are not, um, not uh, irrational. Um, people with delusions don't actually suffer from faulty reasoning, he thought. Instead, what he thought was going on was that people with delusions are, have very st strange, striking, unusual experiences of some kind, 
and that they're just trying to make sense of those experiences, much in the way that you or I might try and make sense of them. So he has a, a famous quotation, which is, the locus of the pathology in delusions is in the neuropsychology of experience. So what's pathological, what's, what's um, disrupted for people with delusions is not um, the way they reason about events, but the kinds of experience that, that they're having. All right, so let's look at a couple of specific examples of this, this idea. So we'll start off with Capra delusion, which of course I've already, already mentioned. So people with Capra delusion think that someone close to them has been replaced by an imposter. So how might we explain this bizarre belief in this neurocognitive framework, this framework of anomalous experience? Well, um, Hayden Ellis and Andy Young, um, who are two, two researchers in this field, a, a number of years ago, they suggested that Capgras delusion results from damage to uh, pathways in the brain that underpin our experience of, of faces, um, our emotional experience of faces. So the idea is that there are two different separable components to face recognition, um, a sort of overt pattern matching component that allows you to assign someone an identity when you see them, and a second sort of emotional component that gives you a sort of warm buzz of familiarity when you, when you, when you encounter someone that you know. Now, Ellison Young's idea is that if you have a, a bump on the head or um, some kind of brain damage which disrupts those two components, then you might end up with a, a, a kind of dissociation, a discordance between how that familiar person looks and the way that they feel. Um, in other words, you have an anomalous experience of faces. The idea is that in that context, the idea that the person has been replaced by an imposter might have a kind of intuitive appeal. Well, that person looks a lot like my mum, but something feels a bit strange. Maybe it's because it's not actually mum, she might have been replaced by an imposter. Now, the nice thing about this kind of account is that it's, um, it's, it's scientifically testable. Now, there have been a number of different experiments over the years that have produced evidence um, in support of this neurocognitive account of Capgras delusion. Now, one common uh, paradigm involves presenting people with, um, with pictures of, of faces. So a person might be shown a range of different faces um, of someone that's known, to, of people who are known to them, and also interspersed with the faces of strangers. And while that's going on, they might be hooked up to a skin conductance machine, which measures the, um, the, the extent to which their skin conducts electricity. And you can use that as a, as a measure of, of autonomic arousal or how sort of um, their emotional response to looking at the photographs, if you like. Okay, so moving on to a different um, type of delusion, a, a famous pioneering neuropsychiatrist known as uh, Southard described the case of a young woman who believed that she had a hive of bees buzzing around in her head. Um, this, was, this report emerged in 1912. Um, so the, for a number of years, this young woman believed that she had a swarm of bees in, inside her head, obviously a, a bizarre and distressing belief to hold. Um, now, this patient complained of a noise in her head, and according to Brendan Ma, who's the Harvard psychologist I mentioned a few moments ago, this young woman suffered from tinnitus. So she had this um, audiological condition uh, where she experienced a ringing or buzzing in her ears. And the idea is that she was having a, an anomalous buzzing experience, and in trying to make sense of that experience, she had um, arrived at the, the idea, the explanation, that she must have a swarm of bees buzzing around in her head. So again, here we have a situation where an anomalous experience of some kind yields a, a delusion. Um, another kind of delusion now is known as Cotard delusion. Now this is a very strange and striking uh, phenomenon. Patients with Cotard delusion believe that they're, that they're dead, um, that they've died, um, that they've ceased to exist in some fashion or other. Um, how might we explain this bizarre belief? Um, well, as it happens, I've um, myself seen a young woman with, uh, with this particular condition um, a number of years ago when I was working as a neuropsychologist. Um, so my job at the time was to uh, assess people um, in a large neurology hospital. And um, on this particular occasion, a, a young woman um, came to me for an assessment. And uh, on walking into the office, she was very upset and she was stating repeatedly that she had, had died and was adamant that she had died a couple of weeks prior to the assessment. Um, so she was extremely distressed about this and was quite anxious to learn whether the hospital she was in was, was heaven. 
Um, anyway, happily, this this young woman had a, a, a full full recovery. But during the, the period that she was in the hospital, um, she was experiencing a bewildering array of other symptoms as well. So dizziness, musical hallucinations, tactile and visual hallucinations. So it seemed that for her, her, her experience of the world was, was fundamentally altered. And in this context, the idea that she had died and perhaps entered some kind of afterlife might have seemed reasonable. So again, here we have a, um, a fundamentally altered experience of some kind, a strange anomalous experience and perhaps it's that experience which is shaping the content of the delusional belief. Another example is known as mirrored self-misidentification. So I mentioned at the outset that some patients um, look in the mirror and don't um, recognize their own reflection in the mirror. Instead, they believe that the, the reflection they see is a stranger, someone who might be following them around and living in their house, uh, for instance. Um, there are a number of reported cases of this, um, of this mirror delusion in, in the literature. Um, very bizarre belief, obviously. So how might we explain it using this anomalous experience framework that we've been talking about? Um, well, one gentleman um, who uh, um, presented to a neurology clinic in Sydney a number of years ago underwent fairly extensive neuropsychological testing to try and figure out what was going on with him. And the researchers discovered that he had an anomalous experience of reflected space. In, in particular, he had a, a condition known as mirror agnosia. So mirror agnosia meant that he was unable to interact appropriately with mirrors and had a sort of imp impaired appreciation of mirrored spatial relationships. So for instance, if you were to um, hold an object um, on his shoulder and ask him to reach for the object while facing him into the mirror, whereas you or I would use the reflection to reach our hand back and take the object, he would smack his hand into the mirror or try and reach around uh, beyond the mirror. So his appreciation of mirror spatial relationships seemed to be um, impaired. And the idea is that this gave way to an anomalous experience of, of reflected space. Um, the suggestion is that when this um, gentleman looked in the mirror, a mirror was pretty much akin to a, a window or a hole in the wall. And ordinarily, when we see somebody through a window, that person can't be us. Hence, his assumption that the person he saw in the mirror was a stranger. So again, his delusional belief is arguably underpinned by an anomalous experience. In this case, an anomalous experience of reflected space. The last example I'm going to go through here is known as uh, Deja Vecu. Now, Deja Vecu is a, an extremely intense um, delusional form of Deja Vu. Um, you know, the experience where you, you feel like you've lived through a particular event or... or um, in the past. How might we explain this? Um, well, uh, just to tell you about one specific case. Um, so uh, Martha Turner and colleagues uh, some years ago um, published a, um, a, a case of a, of a man who had suffered a, a, a quite a severe head injury back in the early 90s. And um, after he was hospitalized, he persistently would claim that events current events he was experiencing that he had lived through them before in 1994. So for instance, uh, when the September 11th attacks occurred, he would say, I've seen this before, this happened back in 1994. Turner and colleagues argued that this belief was underpinned by disruption to recognition systems in this, in this man's, um, in the temporal lobe of his brain. Uh, and that disruption had generated false feelings of familiarity. Okay, so let's put this together. So the idea here is that delusions of various kinds um, arise when some kind of damage or disruption to the brain produces a strange, striking, anomalous experience and that the affected individuals simply try to make sense of this experience the best way they can and that's what produces the delusion. So an anomalous emotional experience of faces might give rise to the Capra delusion, which is the imposter delusion. An anomalous buzzing experience may produce the, the delusion that someone has um, a swarm of bees buzzing around in their head. Um, and an anomalous experience of reflected space might give rise to the idea that the person you see when you look in the mirror is not you, but a stranger who might be following you about. Lastly, an anomalous experience of familiarity may make you feel that you've lived through events that you're currently experiencing, sporting matches, for instance. So is this a complete, satisfying explanation of delusion? Is anomalous experience sufficient for a delusion to develop? Well, according to Brendan Maher, the Harvard psychologist I mentioned earlier, 
Uh, the answer to this is yes. As, as he thought, delusions are normal responses to unusual experiences. They're not irrational responses. And the idea is that if you or I would have the same experience, we would also end up expressing the same delusion. However, there are reasons to think that Ma might be wrong about this and that anomalous experience by itself is not sufficient for a delusional belief. And the reason is um, something that may have occurred to you already. Some of these experiences are not really unusual. In fact, they're quite common. So tinnitus, for instance, is an extremely common experience. There are tens of millions of people throughout the world who have anomalous ringing or buzzing sounds in their ears, but very few of those come to adopt the belief that they've got insects, uh, bees, for instance, um, swarming around inside their heads. Likewise, deja vu is a very common experience. I'm sure many of you will have experienced deja vu in your life without um, developing this delusional deja vu, this sense that you have actually lived through events that you're currently experiencing for the first time. Indeed, there's a, there's a case in the literature of a woman who had medication-induced um, deja vu, and she described watching TV and felt as though she was watching repeats, even though she knew she knew she wasn't. Um, but this 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 woman wasn't actually delusional. She knew that she wasn't actually watching repeats, but she had a strong sense of having lived through these experiences beforehand. Um, there are also cases of mirror agnosia that have been reported without mirror delusion, for instance. So there are people who can't interact appropriately with mirrors, who seem to have an impaired appreciation of mirror spatial relationships, but who don't go on to believe that the person they see in the mirror is a stranger. So it feels like anomalous experience is not actually sufficient for a delusion to develop. At least this is what myself and some of my colleagues have argued. We've instead suggested that to explain delusions, um, you need to um, point to two separate cognitive factors. Um, the first of these factors may well be an anomalous experience which accounts for the content of a delusional belief. So the type of experience you have will, um, will determine whether the delusion is a delusion about bees in your head or about your mum being replaced by an imposter. But for the reasons I outlined a minute ago, we think that that experience in itself is not sufficient for a delusional belief to develop. Instead, you also need a second cognitive factor. And it's the, that factor which accounts for why um, the belief is adopted and maintained despite its wild implausibility. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any time to tell you more about the second factor, but in the last few years, we believe we've made some progress in, in understanding that. Um, but that will have to wait for, a, for another time. So I'm going to finish off there and thank you very much for listening.